Dave, we have not had the privilege of meeting just yet. My name is Daniel Groves, and I have the privilege alongside my beautiful wife of serving you in this incredible church, and we're so grateful for what God is doing. We're building on where we've been. We're continuing to build where we're at, and we're excited about where God is taking us. And today, I want you to do something. I want you to prepare your hearts, because if maybe you're not used to taking notes, today's the day that you're going to want to write some things down. If you have an iPhone, port your iPhone. If you have a droid, you can just put it on the floor and kick it under your seat. Uh, <laughs> Come on, come on, guys. Come on, hey. No, today's going to be a great day. Uh, we have a friend in the house who came last summer during our relationship series and brought the word named Pastor Tim Ross. And he was a friend then, but now he's become family. So come on, Hope City. Can we give a Hope City welcome to our family, Pastor Tim Ross from Embassy City. Let's go, Embassy City Church. I love you. That was good for me. Let's give it up for Jesus one good time. Thank you, God, for Jesus. Hi. Hi. I love you. I missed you. So grateful to be here with you all again. And I'm on assignment, so I just want to get straight into the word. Is that all right? Whether you're in the building or you're watching online, we are so grateful that you are here. Uh, and I just want to take you to a passage of scripture and read uh, 14 verses, and then I'll give you the title and we'll pray and see where the Holy Spirit takes us. Ezekiel chapter number 37, Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter number 37. I'm reading the first 14 verses. Uh, I believe that there's something here for you, for you individually and for uh, the church corporately. I believe that there is a word in these verses for you. Ezekiel chapter number 37, starting at the first verse. Here's what it says. The Lord took hold of me and I was carried away by the spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, son of man, can these bones become living people again? Oh, sovereign Lord. I replied, you alone know the answer to that. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke the message just as he told me. Suddenly, as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. The skin formed to cover their bodies, but they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, from the four winds, breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me and breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying we have become old, dry bones. All hope is gone. Our nation is finished. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I will open up your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, oh, my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you and you will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. That's good stuff all by itself. If you're taking notes on this message, please take notes. Uh, how, many, how many people are note takers in the room? Be loud and proud. Put your hands up real high. You should be proud because nerds rule the world. If you're taking notes, you are a nerd. And uh, if you're a good note taker, in three days time, this will be your sermon. So you get to preach it as if it was yours and I never said a word. 
That's what I do to great sermons that I take notes on in three days time. All I say is I was in the Lord's presence and he just gave me a download. I got 17 points that I want to run past you because I believe God has spoken. Four words. Please write this down. My assignment is to preach for you from the subject hope for the future. I want to talk to you about your hope for the future. Bow your heads. Let's pray over the word before I get started, shall we? Holy Spirit, thank you for giving us hope. Amen. <laughs> I pray quick. I know all the intercessors are mad, but I'm the one you went over for Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Ezekiel 37 is uh, one of uh, the most profound and attractive uh, passages of scripture uh, for Pentecostal preachers. Uh, I grew up in uh, Pentecostal holiness, charismatic environments where we had revivals for two days and three days and seven days and 21 days. Yeah. Or whenever the spirit lifted or the person decided to release the hostages. I don't know exactly <laughs> which vibe it was, but we were in there as long as we had to be in there. And uh, if you ever uh, heard a preacher go to Ezekiel 37 in those churches I grew up in, you would just hear this resounding uh, noise hit the room when they said, turn to Ezekiel chapter number 37. They would go, mm hmm. It's about to go down. That is the valley of the dry bones. You better preach it, Doc. We would hear these great messages about revival that come out of it, but upon further investigation, there's not one message there about revival. There's actually three messages there. God takes Ezekiel and begins to ask him a question about a group of people, the tribe of Judah, uh, that had been in captivity uh, from the Babylonians back in uh, 586 B.C., and in an open vision that would give him clarity on what he wanted to do with his people, uh, he, he sends Ezekiel to a valley of dry bones. And he asked this significant question, can these bones live again? What, what I love about Ezekiel's answer is that uh, he does not try to be smart enough to think that he can answer God and know what he wants to do. So in the most brilliant retort of all time, he goes, you know, you ain't about to put that on me. You know, if these bones can live again, I do not. And God says, I'm glad you put it back on me. Because you could never do this in your own strength. You could never do this in your own willpower. You would need me to do it anyway. So I'm grateful you put it back on me. Here's my answer, Ezekiel. Yes, these bones can live again. Now, these weren't just dead bodies that had been decomposed for two or three days. These weren't even dead bodies that had been decomposed for two or three months. These bones had been left in this valley for so long that they were only bones and then they were separated and scattered all over the place. So a thigh bone belonging to Sheila was on the other side of the valley and her skull was over there. Tommy's fibula was over here. And 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 his and his clavicle was over there. It wasn't that they were just uh, dried out. They were disconnected because that's how the people felt. And he said, I'm telling you right now, even though these are dried out bones, they can live again. And it's not just one message that God gives Ezekiel. He actually gives him three. And the first message he gives him, he says, hey, prophesy to the bones and tell these bones to get back together. I am a visualist. I am a literalist. When you tell me something, I listen to it literally. And when you talk to me about something, I literally see it. When I read the Bible, I literally am watching the narrative go down. I'm not reading it. I'm, out, I'm watching it. And the moment he said prophesied to the bones, the first thought I have is, can bones hear? <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to be dead, intact, with skin on, chilling. 
get up. Uh huh. <laughs> it's another thing for your fractured skull to be over there, <laughs> and your ankle bones to be over here, <laughs> and you just gonna shotgun prophesy <laughs> in the middle of all of it. Get up. And what I love about Ezekiel is that he doesn't question God. He just goes, if this is what you want, I'm going to do it. And if it's you, it's going to happen. And if it's me, it's not. And so Ezekiel prophesies to the bones. And when he prophesies to the bones, a rattling begins. And this rattling and shaking was an indication that this was definitely the word of the Lord. And these bones start getting back together from all over the place. And here's the thing. The bones don't go to the wrong people. (laughs) Sheila's bone doesn't connect with Tommy's ankle. This is not a disjointed, disfigured thriller moment where everybody's coming out like dun, 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 dun. When God puts you back together again, he does a perfect job every single time. When God is the orchestrator of your realignment, he makes sure that he puts you back together from the inside out, mind, body, and soul. And he says, you will be who I've called you to be. And you'll be in alignment. And so all of these bones start getting back together. And the bones get back together. And then muscles and tendons get on the bones. Because bones without muscles and tendons cannot stand up straight. They need support. So it's not just that he structured their life. He brought accountability and he brought he brought uh, reinforcement and support back to those bones. Not only did he bring the muscles and tendons on top of the bones, but he put skin on top of the muscles and tendons and gives them an identity. Because who are we if we are supported and we are put back together if we don't have the proper identity? God puts them back together from the inside out. Structure, support, and then he gives them an identity. But here's the thing that is crazy. They are all put back together. They are all back in alignment. They got their bones back together where they need to be. They have their muscles and tendons on top of those bones supporting it. They have an identity that they have been reclaimed with. And now they're still lifeless. Scripture literally says that all of this miraculous thing happens, but there was still no life in them. Can you imagine a miracle happening from God that leaves you Lifeless. The strongest indication I can take from this passage is that one message is not enough for you. One sermon is never going to be the thing that takes you over the top. It's the consistent hearing of the word of God that will continue to pull you out of the circumstances and the situations, the ideologies, the habitual sins that you have been in. And, and, and the message puts them back together, but they're not alive. I want you to see what I see when I read the text. (laughs) They're back together, but they're not alive. (laughs) This is how some of y'all looked at the beginning of the year. (laughs) We came off Christmas break, but we were not alive. And can you imagine Ezekiel watching this miracle happen? A great army standing there, lifeless. <laughs> um, is there anything else you want to say? Because I got nothing. He says, oh, oh, there is something else I want to say. Now, I, I want you to prophesy again. But, but, but this sermon has nothing to do with him. You won't even be preaching to them on this next sermon. 
The first sermon was to get them back together. They, they, they are now back in alignment. They are now back in community. They now have an identity again, but they're not alive. And this next sermon, you would think you need to preach to them and tell them to come to life. No, you got to talk to the life giver. When you're faced with a dead thing, you don't speak to the dead thing. You speak to the thing that can reanimate dead things. You speak to the spirit that can give life to the dead things. Some of you all have children that you don't know what to do with, and you're constantly trying to talk to them. Stop talking to them about the dead situation they're in and start talking to the Holy Spirit about the dead situation in there and say, Holy Spirit, get in there. Holy Spirit, handle your business. Holy Spirit, deal with my child. Holy Spirit, deal with my marriage. Holy Spirit, deal with my attitude. Holy Spirit, deal with my past. Son of man prophesied to the wind. What? Don't even talk to them. Just talk to the air. Tell it to blow. And I promise that what looks dead now will come back to life. God, I don't know who this sermon is for, but I feel it in here. There are some people in this room. The next 30 days is not going to look like the last 30 years because God's about to blow on the inside of you and take you to a place you have never been in your entire life. Okay. So what had happened was he just prophesied to the wind. Blow! Because, you know, when we read stuff, we reenact it and make it, we, we, we make it good enough for Hollywood. This is just a regular dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like regular degular. He just walks into the situation. He's just obeying God. It ain't pretty. It's not dramatic. There's no smoke machines. There's no lights. There's no nothing. It's just a dusty valley that he's prophesying into. Bones get together. It happens. He's like, Word. I ain't even, okay. <laughs> then, then, then he just prophesies to the wind. He says, blow. And, and, and he says, come from the four corners. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't just blow in one direction. Because you don't know where these people have been. Yeah. So I don't want to presume that everybody's coming from the east side. I don't want to presume everybody's coming from the west side. I don't want to presume we just need a northern, a northern wind or a southern wind. So blow from all directions. Blow on all the people in the room. Bring the north side to the south side, the south side to the north side, the east side to the west side, the west side to the east side. Bring the blacks and the whites and the Hispanics and the Southeast Asians and the Koreans and some Croatians and whatever your 23 and me told you you were last week. 83% Nigerian, 11% European. Whatever's on the inside of you, blow in my generations, blow in my family, blow on my culture, blow in my heritage, blow wind, blow. This is not just for me. I need everybody on my row to get this. The worst thing that can happen is that I get the breath and you don't. I'm not going to spend 2022 surrounded by people who wouldn't inhale the breath of life. I don't know who this is for. But don't hold your breath through this season that we're going through right now. Don't you sit there and let the winds of revival hit the whole room and you sitting up there like this. <gasps> you going to pass out? You going to turn blue or purple or whatever your hue is going to allow you to do. And then you're going to faint. You're going to wake up and you would have missed the move of God. Because it didn't come the way you want it. The wind blew. And they all came back to life. And they came back to life. And you would think that there would have been people doing laps. When I think about revival, I think about people doing laps. Because, you know, you can't go from being dead to alive 
and like act that, just act like that's normal. <laughs> like you can't go from this to this. <gasps> well, amen. Just felt a nice little breeze blow through here and, uh, and I was dead and I'm alive. This is awesome. No, 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 no. When, when, when revival hits you, that's not something that you can act like is just normal. When, when, when you were dead and you were alive, you don't just go, <gasps> you go, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I was dead. Now I'm alive. I was blind. Now I see. I was lost. Now I'm found. And I got to tell somebody about it. They were alive. Yo, they were alive. They were dead. Now they were alive. But when they looked at what they, they were revived to, when they looked at their surroundings, once they were alive again, here's what they said. We're not where we are where we were born. Th th this is not our ancestors' sacred land. W we're not back where we belong, so all hope is gone. Two sermons in, you would think this would be the revival of a generation. And their assessment of what God had done was, I appreciate you resurrecting me, but look at me. Look at us. Look where we are. All hope is gone. Here's what I love about God. God lets them lodge this complaint. As presumptuous as it is. In many ways, as low key disrespectful as it is. He lets them say what they feel about their situation. Because sometimes God will let you talk about a circumstance and a season you're going through recklessly so that when he brings you out of it, he can look at you like, what was you saying again about? <laughs> hey, remember in 2019, you thought that you was going to die in this situation? How you feel about yourself now? I just, I just want you, I'm, I'm not being petty. I just want to remember <laughs> just trying to figure out what you said back then. All hope is gone. Now, let me tell you something. I... I know what these people feel like. I'm not here to judge them. I'm not here to, to, to cast dispersions on them. And here's why. Because I've been there. My, 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 my youngest brother was killed in a car accident on September 17th of 2004. We were 17 months apart. Our parents dressed us like twins. Even when folks found out we were not twins, either identical or fraternal, my mom was just lazy. <laughs> she went to the store and she was like, two orange shirts, two blue jeans, wear them. Y'all don't have no individuality until you get your own money. I'm buying two shirts off this rack. That's what you're going to wear, okay? We were very, very tight, and then he, he gets killed. And here's what I learned about God in that season. He's not petty. I was depressed for four months. The darkest, deepest depression I've ever been in in my life. And here was my narrative to God as a believer in Jesus Christ. All hope is gone. I can't believe you took my brother and didn't even have the decency to talk to me about it before you did it. I'm never preaching again. I told him that. I also told him some other stuff that I can't say to y'all <laughs> without censorship being involved. Also, beep, 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 and another thing, beep, 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 beep. Here's what I found out about God. He wasn't waiting for me to be done to slap me in the face. He let me get it all out. Then he said, I got a word for you. <laughs> if you're done talking, I got a word for you. If you're done complaining, I got a word for you. If you're done telling me what's not going to be, I have a word for you. If you're done writing an obituary on this season of your life, I've got a word for you. If you're done thinking that you know exactly what I'm going to do next, 
I got a word for you. And I've come to tell Hope City that he has a word for you. That he's not just speaking about your past and your present, but he wants to give you hope for your future. You see, the third sermon that is preached by Ezekiel is to prophesy to the future hope of Israel. Tell them that I'm bringing them back together. And what I'm going to do in their future is so much more than what I've done in their present and their past. I'm speaking to a people about what God wants to do with you moving forward. The last seven years has been great, but God hasn't even begun to do the work that he's about to do through you. And he needs you to be reminded today that what he has for you is a future. What he has for you is a hope. And it's going to spread all across Houston and all across the Southwest and all across this nation. And you have a part to play in it. Which is why you haven't died. Which is why you have not been eliminated. Which is why you survived the rejection. Why you survived the abuse. Why you survived the trauma. Why you survived the misunderstanding. Why you survived all of it. Well, so that he could put you back together. Reconnect you. Breathe life on the inside of you. And then tell you, I have a future and your name is written on it I have a purpose and a plan for this city and you have a part to play in it and whether you're watching me live or online you need to know there is hope for your future there is hope for your family and there is hope for you can you imagine what it would be like if you would own this narrative if you walked out of this place today if you if you, if you signed off the, the broadcast and you said to yourself, I'm a part of this. Yep. I wish somebody would try to tell me I'm not a part of this. <laughs> not after what I just heard today. I have hope for my future. I'll never forget the lowest point of, uh, uh, of, of, of the season of my life uh, when I was grieving my brother's death and I, I contemplated suicide. When I tell you contemplate, I'm talking about close. Revolver in hand at my parents' house. And the Holy Spirit became the great therapist and counselor on that day. And he intervened while I had the gun in my hand and said, I need to have a conversation with you. You are about to make a permanent decision based on a temporary circumstance. And we need to have a conversation. I'm not done with you yet. I acknowledge your pain. I acknowledge your, your hurt. I acknowledge how dark this season feels but my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And Tim, this may sting a little, but I'm sovereign and I don't need to answer you. You are either with me or you're not. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit gave me the power to put down that gun and believe that he had a future for me that was brighter than the day that I was in at the time. And I'm only here today because I believed in the promise of the future hope that what he wanted to give to me and my family. This weekend, I feel it's the same for you. And so in this moment, I just want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I just wanna ask you, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message. I don't know which prophetic word you happen to be in at the time. I, I, I don't know if you're, you're, you're resonating with the first one where God is reconnecting you after a season of feeling disconnected, disheveled, scattered, dried out, dead. Maybe you're saying, you know what, Tim, it's that first message. God is bringing me back together again. He, he's restoring some things in my life right now that I thought would never be restored. For some of you all, you got your life together, but there's no life in you. And you need the Holy Spirit to breathe into your soul and awaken some things that you pronounced a eulogy over long ago. Some promises that God has given you that you thought, you know what? I've just already had a funeral for it. He doesn't want to do that in my life anymore, obviously. I'm too old. The time has expired. I thought it was gonna happen in another state. 
And God's going, I'm bringing you back to life right now. And for some, you're in this room right now and what you realize is God's given me hope for my future. He's not done with me. He's not done with us. He's not done with a move of God at Hope City Church. So while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, there may be somebody in here that needs to give their life to Jesus. Whether you're watching me live or you're online right now, I, I just want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as Lord. And I always ask, w would you be against giving your life to Jesus today? After what you've heard and, and maybe the Holy Spirit has just made you realize that Jesus is real. Would you be opposed to giving your life to Christ today? And if the answer is no, what, what stands in the way from you making that decision right now? Is it pride? Is it, is it shame? Is it fear? Is it the inability to get all your questions answered before you take a step of faith? Whatever it may be, if you can put that to the side and believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. And if you can change your mind about the way you've been thinking about living your life, the Holy Spirit will step in and be the leader and guider into all truth. Our truth has a name. Our hope has a name. And his name is Jesus. And so, Father God, I pray right now for every single person that has opened their life to giving it over to Jesus Christ. Thank you that hope has come in and that is standing strong on the inside of them and that their future is brighter than ever because right now they have you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we clap our hands for all of those that have made that decision? Whether you did it in this room or you're watching online and you did it, we celebrate. Come on, we can do better than that. Turn up. We are turning up for every person that has just come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your shed blood. Thank you for the justification that we have because of our relationship with you. Well, listen, y'all, I, I, I am I'm family now, which means if anybody messes with y'all, I drive up here, right? I'm from Cali, so, you know, um, I'm from the hood. <laughs> Inglewood, to be exact. So if I fly here, that means everything's good. That means everybody's cool. But if I drive here, I pop the trunk. <laughs> and if I pop the trunk, I pull out them things. And if I pull out them things, they go bang. In Jesus' name. <laughs> All right? But this is a special, significant uh, weekend. Uh, and I want to call uh, Drs. Uh, Scott and Karen Hagen uh, to help us with a very pivotal transition uh, in this service and in the life of Hope City Church. So would you welcome Dr. Scott and Karen Hagen right now? Love you. Hey Amen. How many? How many were profoundly moved today by the message by Pastor Tim Ross? Pastor, tremendous. Just want to introduce uh, my wife, Karen. My name is Scott Hagan. I serve uh, at a university up in Minneapolis. And why are you on this stage all of a sudden? Today's a very special day. I've been in invited by the graciousness of those who serve as overseers of this great church uh, to participate in a very, very special moment, uh, really a pastoral prayer, and to announce that today at Hope City that your pastors, Dan and Jackie, are no longer the interim pastors. They are now the pastors of Hope City Church. Hope City, would you welcome to this stage your pastors, Daniel and Jackie Groves.
Just remain standing. I have the distinct honor this morning um, to pray a prayer of installation and commissioning for our dear friends. We've known, forgive me when I say Dan and Jackie, uh, we've known them for a long, long time, but pastors Daniel and Jackie Groves, these are world-class leaders who did not just show up here yesterday. They have been formed by the Lord and fitted to this generation and fitted to this assignment. And it's our joy to pray for you. I have a specific charge for you, Pastor Daniel and Jackie, and then a charge for Hope City. And then I'm going to have my beautiful bride and Pastor Karen lead us in a prayer for you today. You know, I've often told leaders, it's not what you achieve in this life, it's what you set in motion. Because most of what we do, we're not going to see the full result this side of heaven. And I believe that God set this church in motion about seven years ago. And I believe it's unstoppable for the kingdom. In 1 Samuel, I think it's verse or chapter 11, Samuel tells the people of Israel to go back and let's go to Gilead and let's renew the kingdom. It's a powerful phrase. And I believe today, this message, Pastor Tim, this moment with the overseers, that the kingdom is being renewed here in Houston today in a way that is historic and very, very powerful. The scripture says also in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 6, one of my favorite verses, and I give it to you, and I'm going to pray this over you in just a moment. As you know, Saul was sent out on one assignment, and while he was on that assignment, the real assignment emerged. And you came to Houston with one assignment, but God had in store for you in his divine mystery of all things, another assignment. You know, about half our life is a result of good strategy and the other half we never saw coming. And you've been able to capture the part you never saw coming because you've lived a prepared life. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 9 verse 6, the servant that went with Saul because the assignment uh, wasn't unfolding with the kind of success or expectations they thought. And Saul found himself in this ambiguous, liminal place. This idea of a threshold between what he had known and what he must become. And Hope City's been in this threshold, this liminal space between what we have been and what we now must become. And in that space, the Bible says, the servant says to Saul, hey, I've just thought of something. There is a man of God who lives here in this town. He is held in high honor by all the people because everything he says comes true. Hey, let's go find him. Perhaps he can tell us which way to go. It's the highest compliment of heaven that can ever be said over our lives as spiritual leaders. They said, you know what? We're kind of lost right now. But we, we know that there's a person in this city. And I would say there is now, therefore, in this city a couple. They're people of God. They're honorable because all that they says comes true. Let's go find them. Perhaps they can help us with our journey. I believe tens of thousands in this region and beyond from neighborhoods to nations are going to be looking to this house because there is now therefore in this city an honorable man and woman of God. Every, everything they say, they say comes true because you preach the word of God, the promises of God. That's what fills our mouths. Let's go find them. Now, my charge to you, Hope City, is this. First Chronicles chapter 12, the Bible says that David was in Ziklag. And, and the Bible says, many translations says he was in a restricted space. I, I felt, I lead a university in the inner city of Minneapolis between covid what's happened in our world, all that's gone on. It has felt like a restricted space. But here's what God does in a restricted space. And I say this over Hope City, and we're going to pray. The Lord began to bring a new wave of people, and he began to activate the familiar people in three powerful ways. The Bible says that these people came to David in a restricted space 
who could fire an arrow with a left hand or a right hand. They were ambidextrous, it says. They could sling it with the right hand or the left hand. It's crazy. In a restricted space, God began to emerge people without natural restriction. And I believe that God is giving you a congregation that can sling it with the left hand or the right. That they're going to be able, they're going to be able literally to do the work. One person doing the work of two. Then it says another group of people came and it says their faces shone like lions. There was a fearlessness, a fierceness, a courage, a leaning in because their faces shone like lions. Hope City, now's the time to sling it with your left hand or your right and for your faces to shine like a lion. Then it says this lastly. It says he brought another group of people to David in a restricted space men from the tribe of Benjamin and Judah and he says are you with me or against me are you here to kill me or help me and they said to David we're here to help you to serve you and then the Bible says that David then made them captains over his army now you know and I know how leadership works how can you become captain in one day I'm just telling you in a restricted space a restricted season God resurrects the restriction People are going to come to you and become like captains in a day. Leaders that you have never seen. There are captains all over this room. They're going to be released into leadership. I'd like to invite the overseers if you would step up. And, and I would I'd like to invite one, I think one of the great voices and women of faith I've ever met. My bride, she's going to pray a prayer of commissioning and ordination over you on this great day. All right, let's pray. Why don't you raise, put your hands towards the stage, pour, towards your new pastors. Holy Spirit, we thank you today that you are here and that you are casting vision, God, over this house, Lord God. I thank you, Father, that Dan and Jackie have, Lord, been raised up for this moment, Lord God. You've prepared them, God. Father, you have gone before them. You have surrounded them, Lord, and you are their rear guard, Lord God, and you have made them ready, Lord, to take up Father, the reins of this house, God, and to lead, Lord, into this new season, God. And Lord, I declare, Lord, and I thank you, God, that in a new season, God, that there is new mandates, there is new jobs, there is new assignments, God. And when those things happen, God, and when we come into an alignment, God, with the new vision, Lord, miracles will take place. And so, God, we just declare that over this house, that this will be a house of miracles. This will be a house of healing, God. This will be a house of restoration. This will be a house of salvation God for this city God we just install them God into this moment and into this time Fa father for your vision and for your glory God and we give you all the praise and all the glory and everybody said together amen Amen. one last time welcome your new pastors Daniel and Jackie Grove I think our words should be few. Um, we said this since the beginning of all of this, that we're here. Our heels are dug into the ground and we're ready to move forward with hope. We remember where we've been, we build from where we're at. Thank you, Pastor Tim, for preaching such a prophetic word yes. of hope for the future. It was a right, it was a right on time word. Last week we talked about Hebrews chapter 3 verse 4 and it says the house is built by someone the builder of all things is God this house Cinco Woodlands online this house has always been built on God it's never been about any specific person now it took two people seven years ago named Jeremy and Jennifer Foster who said yes to the call of God on their lives that said there's going to be a church called Hope City that's going to reach the neighborhoods and the nations and so the currency of transition is honor and we will always honor where we've been yeah. we will build from where we are at yeah. and we are excited about yeah. the future so we are here and we are grateful that we get to do this with with you guys we are grateful that we get to celebrate with thousands of people in this city and pastor scott I, I, it's 18 years you've taught me Tell me how to be a dad. 
Tell me how to be a, a good husband. And to have you pray over us today. This whole moment, to be able to do it around family. Just look around the room, y'all. This is what a church like heaven looks like. <laughs> multicultural, multi-generational. This is what... But to know when we were just Dan and Jackie and didn't have babies and had no clue what we were doing, that God knew the beginning to the end. So again, we honor where we've been. And we're asking you, will you join us to continue to take this city for Jesus? Yeah. Because Hope City is good ground, always will be good ground, always has been good ground. Amen. Amen. We are so thankful. I will, I will keep my words few. We are so thankful. So wait a minute. So, so thankful. Was... We love you. Hope City is our family. And it has been for a long time. And we are honored and so, so grateful. We are ready. We, I love every word that Pastor Karen prayed. I love that this is going to be a house of miracles. We have seen them countless, and we will see many, many more because God is not done with Hope City. Amen? Amen. We are ready. We are so honored that we get to serve you all and our city and our nation and our world all together, and we're ready. Amen. Can you lift your hands towards heaven so we can just pray together? Father, thank you again for the opportunity, God, to be a part of revival, to be a part of something that you breathe life into. God, that heaven really has touched earth the past seven years. Seven meaning completeness, going into year eight, 2023, new beginnings when we build that new building while we open that new building called the silos. God, thank you for what is to come. Thank you, God, for the miracles. Thank you, God, for the breakthrough. Thank you, God, for the deliverances and the restoration that's already breaking out across our city, the neighborhoods, and the nation. We trust you and we honor you, and we are grateful for the opportunity to do this together. The best days of Hope City are in front of us. And through the filter of faith, we see, God, what you see. Yes, Lord. So we say yes again to this assignment every day. And we allow you to move, flex, throw your weight around the room and do what only you can do because you're a big God and you're a strong God and you're a mighty God. And we honor you as such in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, Hope City. Can we give God praise one more time?